It's the year of 1069, now well into the bloody reign of King William the Conqueror. 1068 had proved an eventful year for the new Norman masters of England, William himself having to besiege and subdue the city of Exeter. He had also marched north to calm York and drive some rebellious English nobles out. The sons of Harold Godwinson had also landed south, ravaging the area but made no serious attempt to reignite the Godwinson claim to the crown, withdrawing back to their base in Ireland. The north in particular had proven a stubborn area, with William initially having appointed a native lord, Gospatrick, the Earl of Northumbria. Gospatrick, though, now shouted in the court of Malcolm, King of Scots, as a rebel. William, therefore, in early 1069, changed his approach, instead sending a foreigner by the name of Robert Cummin north to claim the territory. Not much is known about the new earl, though a later source states he hailed from the Flemish town of Commons, his men like himself likely being Flemish mercenaries. King William had previously sold the earldom to Copsey, another native and incidentally a former supporter of Tostig Godwinson, brother of the vanquished Harold. Copsey had swiftly been murdered by his rival Oswulf, who himself was slain soon after by a random robber he was tracking. Cognizant of the danger, the newly minted Earl Robert rode north with anywhere between 500 to 900 men, though this was no bloodless procession. According to local source Simeon of Durham, Robert cut a trail of blood, pillage and destruction en route to his new domain. His sphere of control was to be the area beyond the Tyne, and so unsurprisingly many folk attempted to pack up and flee. Unfortunately for them, however, great snows and foul winter weather prevented this. With no recourse, the terrified people plotted how best to rid themselves of this new tormentor. In an encouraging sign, for King William at least, the recently reconciled Ethelwine, Bishop of Durham, rode out to meet Robert. He advised the Earl to halt his advance, fully aware of the locals' preparations to resist, though Robert predictably dismissed this, arrogantly entering Durham itself and allowing his men to continue their depredations in their efforts to secure lodgings for the evening. Perhaps in an effort to reinforce his outward confidence to the nervous Ethelwine, the Earl had taken the Bishop's own house as his quarters, yet if confident he was, this was certainly misplaced, as come first light, the Northumbrians who had banded together burst in and rushed through the whole town, killing the Earl's companions. The slaughter was terrible and complete, the very streets choked with the bodies of the slain and stained with their blood. As for Robert to come in himself, he fared little better. Having offered stiffer opposition to their foes around the bishop's house, Robert's Flemish troops were forced to retreat by javelin volleys, after which the place was set ablaze, all within consigned to a hellish and agonising death. Earl Robert himself thus perished in this way on 31st of January. The massacre at Durham was just the beginning. Judging that the time was ripe for their return, the northern leaders Malswain and Gospatrick, as well as the native pretender to the English throne itself, Edgar, returned south to join with the insurgents, all moving towards the city of York. This northern force was more a coalition of malcontents than a cohesive movement. The Northumbrians between the Tweed and Tyne, the so-called St Cuthbert's men of Durham, controlling the area between the Tyne and Tees, and the Yorkshiremen situated between the Tees and Humber. The citizens of York itself threw their lot in with the rebels due to their resentment at hosting a Norman castle within their walls, from which the Norman presence was stark and less than gentle. At York, the rebel army demanded that the people there accept Edgar as their king. Indeed, if he could be brought on side, the Archbishop of York, Eldred, could crown the young pretender, strengthening their cause further. Speaking of strengthening their cause, the rebel leadership also sent appeals across the North Sea to that oft-forgotten contender for the crown, Swain Estrefson, urging him to invade the largely pro-Danish region in support. 
It may have been this prospect that disturbed the peace of King William most when he first heard of it. In York itself, the Norman defenders were not idle. Richard Fitzrichard, the castellan of the castle, took matters into his own hands by sallying out, only to be caught, his men massacred to a man. William Mallet, the Norman sheriff of Yorkshire, wisely elected to shut himself up within the castle, and sent a frantic plea south to King William, in which he made it plain that if he were not relieved quickly, he would surely have to submit. The conqueror would not disappoint. By this stage, the king must have been back on English soil, or had hurried back, for his speed was shocking to all concerned. Orderic Vitalis writes that, quote, Swift was the king's coming. The Anglo-Saxon chronicle supporting him, the rebels were taken completely by surprise by the large royal force, and many were slain, while others were taken alive. Ever resourceful, Malswain and Gospatric somehow slipped through the net, though to where exactly is unclear. Edgar fled back to his royal protector in the far north. Flight, however, was not possible for all, the city of York being ravaged, York Minster itself being an object of scorn to the vengeful Normans. William remained rooted in York while a second castle was erected on Bailey Hill. The king appointed Gilbert de Ghent, another Flemish man, as its keeper, and ordered his new man north to Durham to exact vengeance there. Gilbert dutifully obeyed, though his expedition ultimately failed. According to Simeon of Durham, Gilbert reached as far north as Northallerton, but was then confronted by a thick fog, so bad that his band could barely make out each other. An unnamed voice eerily informed the band that Durham was under the protection of St. Cuthbert, whose relics resided at the place. Either sufficiently cowed by events or simply frustrated by the weather of the world, Gilbert and his men retreated south. Back in York, King William was taking no chances. He left the city and region under the charge of William Fitzosburn, for himself returning south to the ancient capital of Wessex, Winchester. Here, as if to reassure all, perhaps most of all himself, that all was well, he held his usual crown wearing. In York, Fitzosburn successfully repelled a new attack on the city, the English there launching assaults on both castles, though they were defeated, maybe in one of the baileys or in the ditch. If the king was totally confident in holding together his shaky kingdom, he certainly had a funny way of showing it. Around this time, he sent both his queen, Matilda, and his eldest son, Robert, back to Normandy. Trouble was certainly far from over. All the rebel leadership had escaped his grasp at York, probably via the River Humber. Now they schemed with Malcolm in the far north, taking on new recruits to their cause. A prominent addition was the Earl Wolfioff. Wolfioff was angered at being twice overlooked for the earldom of Northumbria. Though he had been granted a territory in the East Midlands, or at least confirmed in it, William had seen fit to erect two castles at Huntingdon and Cambridge. Back south then, William may have braced in trepidation at the storm that was about to break. The rebels poised to sweep down from the north, Perhaps news too that the sons of Harold Godwinson planned another foray south, and most ominously of all, that the King of the Danes was indeed preparing Great Armada to seize England for himself.